In this video, I'm going to teach you how easily we can assess the rhythm on any EKG. As we have discussed in our last video titled The Most Efficient Way to Read EKGs, assessing rhythm is usually the first step in EKG interpretation. A link to that video is provided in the description field, so make sure to watch it. I'm going to teach you a unique and systematic way to assess the rhythm. This way was explained by Dr. Ken Grauer in his excellent EKG books and website. I'll put a link to his website in the description field as well. Before we start, if you have not subscribed to our channel yet, please do so right now and hit the like button if you found this video useful. Let's go. The P's, Q's and the three R's is the way we're going to use today as described by Dr. Brower in his book and website. The P stands for the P waves, of course. The Q stands for the QRS width or duration. And in the three R's, the first R stands for regularity. The second R stands for related. Are P waves related to QRS complexes or not? And the third and final R stands for the rate. So let's translate that into a more practical way. So every time we grab an EKG, I immediately take a look at the lead to strip. I look for the following. Is there a P wave present? Is each P wave followed by a QRS complex or not? Is the P wave is upright or negative? Does the P wave have the same shape and morphology throughout lead to strip? Is there a constant PR interval throughout lead to strip? Is the rhythm regular or not? Is the RR interval regular or not? Is the QRS narrow or not? Is it equal to or less than 100 milliseconds or not? Here I quickly get the QRS duration from the computed value. It's fairly accurate as we mentioned before and I don't have to do it manually. In case you want to do it manually, look if the QRS is wider than half of a large box or not. Remember, each large box equal to 200 milliseconds. And finally, I check what's the rate. Again, here we don't have to do it manually. Just see the computed value. Again, it's fairly accurate. To do it manually, I think I should do a separate video on, the, on that, but we calculate it by dividing 300 by the number of the large boxes in the RR interval. And in very fast rhythm, we use the every other beat weight. Again, it's better to explain how to calculate the rate manually in a separate video. So just get it for the computed value, it's accurate. Now, based on this system, let's describe some of the most commonly encountered rhythms in clinical practice. And today I'm going to mention some of them to keep the video short and finish them in the next few videos. Let's start of course with sinus rhythm. To say the rhythm is sinus, there should be a regular upright P wave that is consistent in shape and morphology. Each P wave followed by a QRS complex with a constant PR interval with heart rate is 60 to 100. If heart rate more than 100, we call it sinus tachycardia. If it's less than 60, we call it sinus bradycardia. Now this description is a lead to description. All this description is by looking at lead two because it's directly opposite to the SA node and the depolarization wave will move directly toward lead two. So that's why the P wave is upright in lead two in sinus rhythm. Now sinus rhythm will be called sinus arrhythmia if it becomes irregular. Everything is exactly the same as sinus rhythm except sinus arrhythmia is irregular. And there is really no clinical significance of sinus arrhythmia. It's a benign process. You don't have to do any further work up or treatment. Now, what if everything is exactly the same as sinus rhythm except that the P wave is negative or inverted, but still regular. Each P wave followed by a QRS complex with a constant PR interval. This is probably a rhythm coming from a low atrial focus or AV nodal junctional rhythm. Now in AV nodal or junctional rhythm, the P wave will stay negative, but the position of the P wave can be before the QRS, embedded within the QRS or after the QRS, based on the speed of conduction downward to the ventricles or upward to the atria. So if atrial depolarization precedes ventricular depolarization, a negative P wave will precede each QRS. If the atrial depolarization followed the ventricular depolarization, then the negative P wave will appear after each QRS very close to it. And if they happen at the same time simultaneously, the P wave will be embedded in the QRS complex. 
And again, what decides this is the speed of depolarization wave upward to the atria or downward to the ventricle. And the reason we have a negative P wave in lead two, because the atrial depolarization now moving away from lead two, coming from the AV node upward to the atria away from lead two. Now junctional rhythm further classified based on the heart rate into junctional rhythm, which is usually an escape rhythm with the heart rate 40 to 60. If the heart rate is less than 40, we call it junctional bradycardia. If the heart rate 60 to 100, we call it accelerated junctional rhythm. And if the heart rate above 100, we call it junctional tachycardia. Now remember this, every time you see an accelerated junctional rhythm or junctional tachycardia, think about the joxin toxicity immediately. Also think about the possibility of acute coronary syndrome. While junctional rhythm or junctional bradycardia are usually a form of escape rhythms when the sinus nodes fails or delayed, and not necessarily a bad rhythm. Now we have to say that having a negative P wave in lead two is not always indicating a low atrial focus or an AV node rhythm. Every time, remember this, I see a negative P wave in lead two, I immediately look at lead one and AVR. If all waves are negative in lead one and positive in AVR, P, QRS, and T wave, then we are dealing with lead misplacement. That lead one place on the right arm and lead AVR place on the left, or the patient has what we call dextrocardia, the heart pointing toward the right, which can be easily checked with a chest X-ray if suspected. Remember, in normal EKG, all waves should be negative in lead AVR. If instead you see all these waves negative in lead one and positive in AVR, then there is a lead misplacement or dextrocardia. So repeat AKG and verify lead correct position. Look at a baseline AKG or look for any old chest x-ray to see if there was any dextrocardia. Let me finish by talking about what we call wandering pacemaker. So we give time for some AKG examples and over the next few videos, we'll discuss atrial fibrillation, flutter, MAT, multi-atrial tachycardia, AV nodal re tachycardia, AV re tachycardia, and wide complex rhythms. So we keep the videos really relatively short and more focused. So what is wandering pacemaker? Simply here the pacemaker slowly and gradually shifts from the sinus node to another atrial focus. The P wave shape will change gradually to a new shape. It will not vary from B to B. That's why it's difficult to diagnose this wandering pacemaker as we will need a long rhythm strip. MAT on the other hand or multi-atrial tachycardia that we will discuss soon in the future videos is different in that the P wave changes from beat to beat and the rhythm is irregularly irregular similar to atrial fibrillation. Wandering pacemaker is usually a benign process that does not warrant any further evaluation or treatment. Now probably you have noticed that I did not include the QRS duration in our rhythm definition so far. You will find a lot of references saying that QRS should be narrow in such rhythm, sinus rhythm, sinus arrhythmia, junction rhythms, and wandering pacemaker, which is mostly true, but not always true, because you can have sinus rhythm with wide QRS if you have, let's say, an underlying bundle branch blocks or intraventricular conduction delay. So remember, narrow QRS is not a must to diagnose a supraventricular rhythm, and I will discuss this in further details in a future video. Now, let's go over some EKG examples. Let's start with the P's. We can see an upright P wave that present throughout, throughout lead two which is similar in shape and morphology. Each P wave is related and followed by a QRS complex with a constant PR interval. The RR interval is pretty regular. And the rate, as I said, there is one, two, three and a half uh, large boxes, 300 divided by 3.5. So it's between, I think, 70 and 80. And the QRS duration, as I said, the QRS here is less than a large box so the qrs is less than 100 equal or less than 100 millisecond so this is a sinus rhythm how about this ekg again look at lead 2 there is an upright p wave present before each qrs complex the p wave is similar in shape and morphology there is a constant pr interval so there is an upright p wave p wave followed each followed by a qrs complex and with a constant pr interval but look, regularity, the RR interval is not the same. So this is an irregular rhythm. 
the QRS is clearly narrow and the rate here because the irregularity I usually get it from the computed value right here if you want to calculate it's roughly around 70. This is exactly like sinus rhythm except this is irregular this is what we call sinus arrhythmia and it doesn't have much clinical significance. I hope this is uh, easy for you to visualize and again lead to strip we look at that P wave and you see there is a negative P wave here there is no upright P wave so we can see here that we may not be dealing with a sinus rhythm and immediately when I see a negative P wave I check for lead reversal is AVR completely negative it is and the lead one is upright that means there is no lead reversal each P wave is similar in shape and morphology each P wave followed by a narrow QRS with a constant PR interval the RR interval is fairly regular and the rate as I said is uh, probably there is one two three four and five between 60 and 70 so this is either a low atrial focus or could be junctional rhythm uh, or what we call accelerated junctional rhythm because the rate is above 60 and it's very hard to tell uh, of course I need a history of the patients taking digoxin or the patient complaining of chest pain or had an MI this is most likely a an accelerated junctional rhythm but again this could be a low atrial focus causing this let's see this EKG which I took from uh, Dr. Grauer um, website and you can find it on his website that I will put a link in the description field and again we look at lead 2 and you see he, he already made it easy for us so there is an upright P wave right and similar in morphology and shape except now when we come to number 4 number 5 and number 6 the P wave changed to negative or flat and resume the normal morphology in 7, 8, 9, 10 and again goes back to the uh, negative or flat P wave in 11 and 12. So this could represent what we call wandering pacemaker. There is a gradual change. There is no change from beat to beat. It's a gradual change. See these three beats have the same uh, pacemaker or atrial focus and back to the sinus rhythm here, back to the uh, another pacemaker here. So this is what could possibly be a wandering pacemaker. The, the RR interval is irregular for that reason and the QRS is narrow. So most likely we're dealing with a sinus rhythm alternating with a wandering pacemaker here. Okay, before I finish here, let me emphasize again that without practice reading EKGs, you will never get better at EKG reading. So keep practicing. Next video, I will discuss atrial fibrillation, flutter, and MAT, multi-atrial tachycardia. If you find this video useful, please give it a like, share it with your colleagues, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you have not done so. Thanks for watching.